Your article, of course, lays out a couple different solutions for countering Russian aggression that don't risk escalating the nuclear threat. And before we get into those solutions proper, um, I want to ask you about sanctions, because obviously the U.S., uh, Canada, uh, European nations, the U.K., plenty of nations, uh, so far the kind of front first first response to Russia has been economic and financial sanctions. And this is kind of interesting because I feel like the expressed uh, motivation behind these sanctions was to you know, punish Putin, punish the Russian elite. But of course, over the last week, we've seen that the value of the ruble has plummeted. Uh, the, the Russian economy appears to be heading into a depression. So let's talk about sanctions for a minute. Is this the right tactic or what does this achieve? And does this actually help de-escalate the situation? Well, I think for, for those of us on the left and people who care about the Ukrainian people, people who want to end war, I think that the point of sanctions should be to put pressure uh, along with political pressure, diplomatic pressure, whatever other kind of pressure you can that doesn't escalate the conflict on Putin, on the Russian leadership to, to end the war or to, to agree to some sort of ceasefire uh, with Ukraine. Um, you know, I think the, the way the sanctions started out, which was to to target some of the oligarchs, to target the Russian leadership. That was the right way to go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think obviously you, you, the, 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 the West or the international community, whatever words or euphemisms you want to use, we, we want to express disapproval towards this. And we want to deter this from happening. Uh, again, you know, whether at the hands of Russia or, you know, another, another country. Um, the, the question is, are these sanctions that are now have enlarged and, and, and broadened and are now really not just specifically targeting the Russian elite, but are very much um, uh, turning into a form of collective punishment. Is that really the way we want to go? Uh, you know, European leaders uh, have, have spoken about collapsing the Russian economy, essentially, uh, which sort of uh, moves us beyond just sort of punishment to, to, to something akin to economic warfare. Uh, my worry is that uh, if, if you end up taking such a indiscriminate um, approach to, mm -hmm. to, to punish uh, Russia by essentially you know making ordinary Russians lives miserable, I, it could beyond the moral aspect, obviously we, 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 this is an appalling way to think about punishing a country for its crimes. you know and this, it's, it's Osama bin Laden's logic, right the idea yeah. that the citizenry of a country is is responsible and equivalent to the crimes of its of its um, its government or its leaders. So we don't want to uh, take that view. Um, and but beyond that, just if, if we think about the the strategy here, what the outcome is going to be. You know, at the moment there is a a quite a lot of opposition within Russia to this war. Yep. It's difficult to know exactly what, because obviously uh, you're not going to get accurate poll results. Uh, and and the media, the Russian media is not really going to give you an accurate picture. And obviously there's been a lot of repression that's been heightened over the past uh, year in particular, but but uh, even, even before then, that means that uh, some of these protests that have been happening have been kind of suppressed. Yeah. Uh, however, what we've seen is we've not, we've not just seen celebrities uh, and, and athletes and other prominent individuals coming out and saying we would not want this war, we want this war to end. But we've also seen there's, there's been a, a flood of petitions and open letters from a variety of uh, 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 professions or sectors of the Russian uh, Russian society and economy that have uh, made the opposition uh, uh, clear. You know, the, the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Center, for instance, uh, called for an end to hostilities. That's a, that's a presidential center museum that gets half of its funding from the the, uh, the the Russian government. And actually Putin is is one of its donors. Um, so they came out and, and they said, you know, we don't want this war. We've also seen the, the Russian Orthodox clergy. I think last I saw it was something like 158 uh, members of the clergy who came out. Mm. And, and the clergy has up to now been pretty allied with Putin because they've, they've uh, supported his kind of social conservative stances um and you know i could go on and on down the list but the point is that there, i think all of this suggests that there is a serious um uh mood against the war within russia and what i would worry is that these sanctions by creating such misery for people within russia you know ordinary war averse russians that it then uh, not only sort of kills this this feeling of global solidarity that i think exists right now between 
uh, the leaders of, of, of the world and also, you know, people all over the world who are, who are quite shocked at this and, and horrified at this war um, and the Russian people. But then that also maybe gives Putin some sort of rallying cry to, right. to basically get this, this disgruntled populace on the side. And he says, well, look, the West is the one, you know, maybe you're not happy about the war, but the West is now uh, using this as a opportunity to kind of squeeze you and to destroy our country. Um, and, and you, you know, you basically killed whatever anti-war movement exists. And a similar thing happened in, in Yugoslavia, actually, with the NATO bombing, mm -hmm. where the, the, because uh, NATO began bombing uh, 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 Serbia, um, the, the movement against Milosevic uh, ended up um, kind of dissipating uh, mm -hmm. because the, the enemy didn't, it was no longer Milosevic at that time. It became NATO right. for, for bombing ordinary people. So, so I think that's some of the concerns that, that, that uh, I think are, are pretty well founded about this kind of indiscriminate approach that's being taken now. Yeah. So let's now turn to some of the solutions that you have offered, um, because I think that you you laid out four different solutions that, you know, uh, don't go down this path, uh, which I think are really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of the solutions that you had put forward, I, I view as sort of more longer term and not something that we can like get done today. But one solution in particular, uh, which is increase humanitarian rather than military aid is something that you advocate for. And that is something that can be done rather quickly. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of revealing or right. uh, that that the the weapons that are being sent to Ukraine. And I and I don't know, you know, I, I'm not a, a military strategist. Uh, and, and so I really don't know whether that's going to change much of the balance of, of, of the, the military balance uh in, in ukraine's favor i don't know how much it's played into you know this resistance the surprisingly strong resistance from ukraine but fundamentally i don't really think i, I suspect it's not going to change much of of what's going on however uh the 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 uh, justification that's been used to to just uh, send weapons which is a billion dollars of military aid in the last year alone is out of concern for the ukrainian people uh, mm -hmm. Right. That's that's what everyone who's kind of supporting this says. We have to support the Ukrainian people. You know, these these uh, javelins, these stinger missiles, all this stuff, all that matters to the to the uh, uh, Ukrainian people. That's what Connor Lamb uh, said uh, uh, recently. Um, but if we care about the Ukrainian people, OK, well, sure. The weapons are being sent. OK, uh, there's there's uh, arguments for and against for why that's a that's a good or bad idea. But surely, if we care about the Ukrainian people, most of whom are not actually fighting in the war, uh, most of whom are either you know fleeing the country or uh, have no access to healthcare, you know, uh, who need food, who need uh, clothing, who need shelter. Surely, we should at the very very least uh, make the humanitarian assistance to to ensure that they can survive this period for as long as it lasts, hopefully not much longer, uh, you know, relatively unscathed. But the reality is, you know, I told you a billion dollars over the past uh, year alone in military aid to Ukraine. A lot of that has come just in the last few months. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just the other day, there was $350 million worth of military aid that was sent over. Meanwhile, uh, over the past eight years, so since the Maidan revolution in 2014, the U.S. has uh, sent over just... 400 million or just over 400 million dollars in humanitarian assistance and this is to a country that is is very poor yeah. uh ukraine is, is is you know if you look at its standings and the kind of development it takes it's very very low it was it was absolutely um you know wrecked in the in the in the wake of the the post-soviet collapse and the neoliberalization that followed um so you would think that 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 would be kind of a more of a high priority if you really if your concern here genuinely was the ukrainian people and, you know, I, I think obviously, I think that does tell us something about what policymakers really, what their priorities are. But beyond that, I think, you know, we should just call for this to be upped anyway as just a moral good, as, as, as mm -hmm. a way to get a suffering people through a terrible, terrible crisis. Um, so I wish there was more of that going on. Um, unfortunately, you know, the most prominent voices tend to be just calling for, you know, more weapons uh, uh, and, and more military support. Yeah. So talk to us now about uh, some of the other solutions that you put forward, because like I sort of hinted at, um, they're a little bit longer term, but I think they're really important as well. So can you run through those? Yeah, sure. I think in the immediate term, uh, I think uh, it's good that there's this crackdown going on in the UK, this, this uh, long overdue crackdown 
on on you know oligarchs hiding their money mm-hmm. um but it, it shouldn't just be limited to the, to the uk this should be a, a worldwide thing because yeah. obviously if you shut down one tax haven there's there's countless others that you can you can go to so i think this should be a worldwide thing i think you know look uh, biden already got uh, uh the world leaders together to agree at least in principle on a 15 uh, percent minimum corporate tax rate uh, mm-hmm. globally so we can, we've seen that that we can actually do this thing where we coordinate domestic policy globally recognizing that that you know that there can be some sort of shared economic policy throughout the world and i think cracking down on tax havens you know the the counts of the amount of money that is being stashed in these things is uh ranges from i think something like 18 trillion to 36 trillion dollars right. um so just imagine if that was instead of being hidden away that was actually being taxed by by these countries um and uh you know that could be put towards a, a whole variety of goods uh, and one of which is, I think, in the longer term, what we what we need to be calling for and what we need to take away from this is the need to aggressively invest in renewable energy to move away from dependence on fossil fuels. The reason why uh, the West has found it so difficult to, to deal with or to respond to Putin in this case, not just Putin, but we think of other authoritarian uh, countries that uh, have huge oil and gas reserves like Saudi Arabia, which you know uh, almost certainly facilitated the September 11 attack and yet faced absolutely no punishment for it from the United States. Why is that? Well, these countries know that because our entire societies and economies uh, run on fossil fuels, that there's only so much uh, you know the international community can actually do to to potentially sanction them, um, or at the very least, they assume that they can accept a certain amount of risk in the way they act on the international stage um, and uh, uh, because of, of, of the fact that they have this product that we all need basically to live our right. lives. Right. Um, and so the sooner we can change it so that we don't, we no longer live our lives needing to, to, to have oil and gas, you know, funding, our, uh, uh, fueling our electricity, uh, you know, our transport, our shipping, all of that stuff. Uh, the sooner I think um, it'll be harder for some of these countries to, to act in these outrageous ways, not just Putin's Russia, but, you know, I mean, look, right now, Saudi Arabia for the, I believe, seventh year uh, is still carrying on this horrific war, which not to undercut what's happening in Ukraine, but the, the war in Yemen has been, in, by every measure, far more uh, horrendous and, right. and, and catastrophic on a, on a far bigger scale. Uh, for seven years, very little outrage about that. And it's actually been supported by a lot of the countries that are now, you know, um, uh, uh, so, you know kind of pointing to Russia and, and Putin as kind of the, the, the sole evildoer in the world. And why are they able to get away with that? Why are they able to count on Western support for this this horrific you know almost genocidal war in yemen well it's because we we need their oil so the sooner we can we can move away from that the the better it is and and i think that kind of hints at, at the the last point that i made and you know these four ideas are by no means the the most um uh, an exhaustive list this was just right, sort of right. four things that i i thought would have been a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, there, uh, there's plenty, plenty more creative ways I think we can respond uh, in a non-military way. But the fourth thing that, that I said was, you know, we in the West need to clean our own houses. Yeah. Uh, because the we just saw today there was this UN vote, right, mm-hmm. uh, to condemn Russia's war, to, to demand the withdrawal uh, of Russian troops from Ukraine. Um, it overwhelmingly, of course, it passed. However, there were many notable uh, abstentions. Uh, and, and I think part of that lies in the fact that in, in the global South, in, say, Latin America, in other places, there is a profound, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say skepticism, there's uh, the, the uh, kind of framing by the West of, of this is, you know, we, we care about international law, we care about international norms and human rights, and that's why we're doing this is considered pretty laughable and, right. and dishonest. And the reason why is because Western countries are supporting things like the the, the Saudi uh, war in Yemen. It's mm-hmm. because of things like the Iraq war. It's because, yep. you know, just before, well, just as this uh, war was being ramped up by Putin, uh, you had the United States withdraw from a 20-year occupation of a country yep. and then p- essentially punish its population for choosing the lesser evil by right. uh, seizing the foreign reserves of that country, 
and they're not just seizing them, uh, freezing them, but 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 taking half of them for themselves, saying we're going to use this to pay the victims of September 11, which the ordinary people of Afghanistan had nothing to do with. So as as long as there's this hypocrisy in in Western foreign policy, it's difficult to. Uh, have people take this seriously. And I think, I mean, in this case, there's a, a remarkable amount of international unity around mm-hmm. condemning Putin and responding in some way, but that's not always going to be the case. And it's because of this, this exact kind of behavior. So I think that's yeah. another thing that we, that we should uh, be calling yeah. for in the West. Let's be morally consistent. Of course, let's condemn Putin, but let's also condemn and end the wars that, that we ourselves are responsible for. Yeah. So I guess kind of related to that, I I wanted to end on a more general question. uh, And that's, um, you know, I feel like in the kind of weeks leading up to the invasion, lots of people on the left, myself included, did not think that Putin would actually invade, right? Like we heard a lot Mm -hmm. of uh, very smart left commentators and journalists, and even people who study Russia for a living, kind of say that they didn't think that this was going to happen. Um, And actually, I I wanna shout out people like Matt Taibbi and Mark Ames and uh, Crystal and Sagar on breaking points because, you know, they were people who had, uh, I suppose, sort of approached the issue skeptically, but then later, you know, have now come out to say like, well, I guess we were wrong on this issue. Let's look at what happened. Um, So a general question is, were you surprised? Uh, And as a follow up, like, why do you think the left got this wrong, so to speak? I mean, I was surprised that he took the, the, the most extreme and, and from my point of view, risky option. I, I always uh, thought an invasion was was possible and that yeah. you know no one should rule it out because Putin, after all, is a very ruthless person. He's a very dangerous person. He doesn't, he, if he sees it in his interest to violate international law and, and do all manner of horrendous things, he'll do it. Um, I think the reason uh, why people were, were sure that, that an invasion wasn't going to happen or or people like myself thought it was the least likely option was because a a full-scale invasion to uh you know potentially do regime change or even occupy ukraine i'm not really sure what his end game is here Mm -hmm. but it 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 seemed like the most risky option it seemed like the most trouble for what it was worth for him if we're just sort of talking about strategy and not not in terms of of morality um because you know if you have to uh, (laughs) we saw what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan right, and right. many other countries that have been invaded over the past you know, 20 years and, and what that looks like for the invader. Uh, we saw it with, with the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Yeah. So it just seemed like, you know, Putin, uh, 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 he's a bad man, of course, but he's generally kind of a calculating figure. Uh, so, you know, you look at some of the things he did uh, before this that were that were kind of uh, that were not kind of that were violating international law, uh, you know, the annexation of Crimea, uh, and and you know the, the the intervention in Georgia, those were both opportunistic kind of uh, uh, responses. Um, he sort of saw his moment and he decided to to uh, sort of jump in and, and use it to to get what he wanted. Um, and in this case, uh, this, this I don't know exactly what his decision making was, what the process of decision making was, but uh, it, this seemed to to it was not just a spontaneous thing. Uh, he must have known for a long time that that invasion was a possibility. And so, um, you know, I think we're just seeing right now exactly why it was such a risk and and, uh, why he may have miscalculated. It seems like on every level, both the the Russian people's tolerance for for this, but also the international community's tolerance for it, um, it it appears to have kind of, uh, and actually the Ukrainians' ability to resist, all that seems to have, have, he seems to have underestimated. Um, Why we got it wrong, you know, I think I mentioned that to you before that that Putin is, uh, uh, you know, I I think he is a calculating figure, even if he is, even if he can make mistakes, uh, as he has here and he has uh, previously. And I think uh, the other reason is that we have this view of, Putin in the West that I think kind of suits him. Um, yeah. People think that they're kind of <laughs> insulting him or that this is kind of a negative portrayal of him. But uh, both both the Republicans and the Democrats, they both view Putin as this kind of evil genius, as this, right. this malevolent mastermind. Um, uh, for Democrats, you know, it, they they look at that and they say, well, you know, he's such a bad man. We have to... to do everything we can to, you know, maybe uh, either, either uh, uh, start a conflict with him or to, to you know, uh, knock him off uh, 
his perch in power. Um, for the Republicans, I think they look at it and they go, oh, you know, this is what a, what a mastermind tactician. We should act like this. We should be just as ruthless and kind of um, uh, uh, contemptuous of, of, yeah. of norms, international law. But the reality is that I don't, I don't think he is a mastermind. I think, mm-hmm. you know, people said the same thing about, about Hitler, right? <laughs> uh, he was this genius and, and everything. And in reality, he was a guy who took a lot of gambles and they worked out for him a lot. And then at one point, they didn't work out for him so right. much anymore. <laughs> Um, and I and it seems like you know I, I don't know where this is going to end up. Uh, I don't know if uh, what's going when when the, when the dust is settled and, and hopefully it will be soon. I don't know what the state of Russia is uh, going to yeah. be, um, but it doesn't look particularly good right now for him. Um, uh, you know, so it seems like he he did that very thing this time. He he made a gamble that was maybe a foolhardy. Um, and he is suffering the consequences. Unfortunately, so are uh, the, the Russian people as well. Yeah. All right. So again, Branko Marchetich has been covering Russia and Ukraine for Jacobin. Uh, he's a staff writer over there. And his latest, this is one of his latest articles. Um, but the one that we just talked about is four ways to counter Russian aggression that don't risk nuclear war. Branko, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thanks.